Hi, today I have with me Davis Sobel, Sobel, and today we are going to be talking about the Glass Universe. Uh, Deva is an author extraordinaire, and I, you've written so many books, I don't even know where to begin, but this current book uh, was published in December, correct? Correct. Yes, yeah, so um, I watched all the YouTube videos on it, and I cannot tell you how much I love this book. And uh, how many books have you written? Because I tried to look it up. And I couldn't find it. <laughs> how many books you've actually written? It depends how you count. So, by myself, uh, Longitude, Galileo's Daughter, The Planet, A More Perfect Heaven, then The Play, and The Sun Stood Still, and now this book. This would be the sixth. But then I've done um, co-authors. So, I, I wrote a book with Frank Drake about... The Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, Is Anyone Out There? And then um, Will Andrews, who was the person who set up the original Longitude Symposium that I went to, and that was the genesis of that book. Uh, Later, he and I did a book together, which was an illustrated version. So he, as a curator of historical scientific instruments, gathered images, oh, I forget how many, we have something like 160 images, and um, and he wrote all the captions. We did Uh, an edition of the book. Oh, that is so awesome. And I I have to tell you that when I sent my request to you to, to do an interview, I always send, you know, I send out a lot of requests every day, and then once a day, I try to pick somebody that I'm I'm pretty sure they're not going to say yes, but I just pray they do. And you were the person for that day, <laughs> like I because I, I was like I don't know it's a little over my head. I don't know if I'm you know if I can do this. And then you know and then you said yes, and I was like oh my gosh, you said yes, and I was so excited. So oh, you know I, you were that person I, for that day. Oh, I, I do that a lot. You know I've been a newspaper reporter and a magazine writer and. I've had to interview lots of people I found intimidating for one reason or another. Right. And, you know, and it isn't the people that you think will be for everybody. I mean, for authors, I'm, you know, I'm I'm intimidated by people that, you know, I don't think other people would be, but it's your own sense of like, you know, and, and you were that person for me because I, I, you know, I read this book and then I saw all the other books you read, you've written. And I was like, okay, this might be more than I can take on, but I, I'm just going to go for it. And then right away you said, yes, so you were so gracious. Thank you so much. Sure. But why, why did you think it was more than you could take on? Um, because, First of all, I I love history books. I mean, that is one of and and I look to you as a historian. And they for some reason, I'm always a little bit more intimidated by people who write history books because it's not a novel, you know. So I, I for some reason, when I'm reading novels, like I I can really like I I feel comfortable. But I was interviewing this guy last week that wrote a book on Alan Turing. And he was British, and we did a video one. And I was so nervous to talk to him. And he, he was like, I just wrote a book about Al. I'm like, I know. <laughs> like, I, there's something about the history authors that I get very <laughs> because I because that's my thing, and that's what I love, and I want to do it justice, and I don't know if I can. I guess it's like that. But anyway, so that's why you were, you know, you. I feel like you are so – you know, when I was watching your YouTube videos and I was like, wow, she just know, like, you know this stuff inside and out. Like, I can only glaze over this information. But, you know, on the other hand, it's like I get to ask you the questions that I was, that were in my head while I was reading it. And that is exciting, too. Well, great. I'm really curious. Okay. Well, first I wanted to start off with telling you that as I was doing the research for this book and I was looking up YouTube videos, I came across, and I don't know if you came across this, I wanted to ask you, this little girl, and she can't be, she's got to be under 10, maybe she's 10, okay, and she did a video on Annie Jump Cannon. No, I haven't seen that. And it's so cute that I wanted to read to you what she said as her conclusion, and maybe she did it for a school project, 
and maybe she didn't, but it was, she was so well spoken. And I was like, there's the future, you know, like there's this girl because I didn't learn about her when I was her age, you know, and so I thought it was so cute. So I just wanted to read to you. I wrote her the last thing that she said when she ended the video. I I wrote down this paragraph so I could read it to you because I thought it was so cute. And she said, um, had it not been for her discoveries, we would not know the heat of stars. We wouldn't know that Orion's shoulder or foot would go supernova or that Ada Karina would go hypernova within our lifetime. Without any jump cannons, curiosities, astrophysics would not be where it is today. We have a lot to thank her for. Oh, my. Isn't that so br- – I mean, she, she was so cute. Anyway, you, you, you know, when you look up Annie Jump Cannon, if you want to go look at her, she, that's all you have to search for on YouTube, and she comes right up. But I was like, I just had to write down what she said because I was like, isn't that just so profound after everything I've read? And, you know, it was so cute. So I just had to share that with you. I have not looked for her on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think you have to because okay. you come up a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah. So anyway, before we get into your writing, what I did for my own, what I love what you did about this book is that, and I didn't know it was going to happen because I never look at the back of the book, is that you made a timeline and you had a glossary and you had, and and when I got there, I was like, oh my God, this just works for my brain. I just want to thank you so much for doing that because even though I read the book, you know, when you're reading history books, dates start to pass you by, um, you know, events start to pass, and you're not, but when I saw the timeline, I was like, okay, and I read through it, and I was like, now it's like, it's like clicks into this, like, place, you know, and I I just love the way that you did that, and I, I just want to thank you, because I think that, okay, I should preface this by saying I'm a homeschool mom. I've homeschooled all six of my children. And which is maybe another reason why I love history books and science books and everything. But what I want to say to all the homeschooling moms that are listening to this, because I know a lot of them um, that are, is that I believe this would be the best start if you have a high school student who's interested in astronomy as a ninth grade, like before they even start the rest of their studies, I would highly suggest this book because I think it's a great starting point to astronomy and learning. You know, you, you, you went into such detail and I'm, you know, from watching your other videos, I know I, you know, saw that you had diaries and you had journals and I mean, I don't know how you put that into the context. Like I'm sure that was just an amazing amount of work that went into the, the you know, making this into a, a book that made sense because I don't know that anybody else could look at all that paperwork and be like, okay, where do I start? You know? Mm-hmm. So anyway, so that's my suggestion for anybody out there who's homeschooling is to start with this book and, I you know, <laughs> I don't think the vocabulary is too hard for a ninth grader. I, I, well, I've had, like I said, if they, they have, you know, after listening to this little girl, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, but I've had, I mean, you have to, with homeschool students, if they're interested in something, they will go for it. And, uh, and, and, and YouTube videos that are out now, they make our children, they know so much more already, you know, and they've probably, if they're interested in astronomy, they've probably already been looking through. YouTube videos on astronomy. So I think that the vocab would, and either they'll know half of it and then get enhanced by it, or, you know, or more. Astronomy terms, because those are all explained. I I just mean the, the narrative. Yeah, I, well, like I said, I think that if that's the route they want to go, that's yeah. just my suggestion as a, as a first, I, I you know. I like sends me to the dictionary. Like yes, it. yes. Me too. And this one sent me to the dictionary a couple of times. So, and, you know, and I'm not, I thought that I knew a little bit about astronomy, <laughs> but, you know, now I know so much more about astronomy and I, I'm so grateful for that. And I would, I would, I'd like to, you know, try to go backwards and explain um, to everybody. I went and saw um, Hidden Figures this weekend and 
Now, I, this was before I watched any of your videos, and then I saw that, you know, somebody asked you that question. You've been interviewed back in December. But, I, of course, since I'm reading your book and doing all of my stuff, I, when I walked out of there, I said, oh, my God, this is unbelievable that I'm reading this book and I'm watching this movie. And, you know, it's about women, and it's about women that – uh, were sometimes given credit for what they did, but a lot of times not given credit for what they did. And as a woman, now I, you know, I, like I told you, I have six children. I did not go to college. I went the route of, you know, raising my children and I'm now 52 and I have seven grandchildren and I don't regret any of that, but it gives me hope for like my daughters and I have five granddaughters and and I was like, wow, I was so impressed that back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, women were out there and they were going to college and, and they were just as yeah. smart as men. And, you know, that's not something we're really taught in school. It's not what I was taught, you know? No, not at all. And when I spoke about this book at Harvard, um, two people there, one person on the astronomy faculty, a woman, told me that, she knew something about these ladies, but she always thought it was just um, a quaint, cute story. She, she never realized they were really doing science. Hmm. And uh, another person who who worked in the, what well, was Will Andrews, in the, in the collection of historical scientific instruments, um, a job he held for, I don't remember now, maybe 10 years. He never heard of them while he was in that position. So um, it's not that it's a secret. Astronomers all know at least Annie Cannon and Henrietta Leavitt. They might not know the others, but they'll know those two. And um, but the um, the whole story that the, how the women got there and how their situation changed over time is what I was interested in doing. I was really surprised that nobody had done it. Right. So, you know, you're, as far as you know, you are the only one to have written a book on these women. Well, there's a book about Henrietta Leavitt. I've seen that. It's called Miss Leavitt's Stars. It's by George uh, Johnson. But, I mean, as a whole, like how, you know, right. from start as to finish, whole, the way you... Story. Yeah, I, as, I am the only one. That's, that's just awesome. So, yes. I yes. Now I know why nobody has done it before. Well, like I said, you know, but when people want to go and check out, you know, you on YouTube, I mean, when you look at those diaries and the papers that you had, I mean, did you have full access to those? Yes. Something I, I want to stress, which I find so interesting, because this has happened to me repeatedly now, writing this type of book, a, a book that touches on the history of astronomy, that information is really available to people. And it's such a privilege. Um, people don't even know they have it. It's like the ruby slippers in The Wizard of Oz. You, as an interested person, can go to the Library of Congress and study just about anything. As long as a family hasn't restricted the access to the paper, you can sit there for the rest of your life and go through those materials, completely open to you. And and I bet you didn't know that. I really didn't. And I've been to the Library of Congress, but I did not know that. I did not know that this would be, that these papers, so they're at the Library of Congress, these well, diaries? The papers were at the Library of Congress. Okay. Most, most of the material I used, including Ms. Cannon's diaries, all of that was at Harvard. I'm not a Harvard staff person. I'm just an interested outsider. So I go to the library. I tell them I want to do a research project. They give me a card. I can now go to the library. I can't take things out. But I can sit in that library forever. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, you know, and I love that they let you do that and, and help awesome was it that she wrote down as much as she did you know like what a blessing yeah you know so that so that you could weave together the story 
you know, is only because of her journals. And because as I'm reading, that's what I kept thinking, because when I was reading the book, I didn't realize, of course, that you had, I mean, I realized that you had to get your research from somewhere, but I was like, how does she know that, like, you know, that they went out, you know, like they ate this or that they did this or they went to, you know, when they went to Peru, when they went to, you know, how did she know all this detail? You know, it was just, it was, it was crazy. And I'm sure it was so much fun to piece together too. It was fun uh, most of the time. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes there's something you really want to know and there's just no way to know it. Right. So, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, to give a, a little bit of history um, for everybody, um, I think we could start with Edward Pickering, who was the fourth director for the Harvard Observatory. And um, I give him so much credit because of hiring all the women that he did at a time that, you know, when it really wasn't, I, I don't know, I guess he'd become frustrated with the men that he had hired. Was that? Oh, that, that is, that's an apocryphal tale. Oh, is it? Here's okay. Everywhere, but I, I am positive that it's, it's a made up story. But you hear that he said my maid could do a better job. Yeah. Well, I had read, I'm trying to think if I got that on Wikipedia, actually, you know, like I, I, there's a good chance that I got that on Wikipedia that he became frustrated. And yes, and then he said, did he say that my maid could do, was that true? No. Oh, it was not true. It's not written down anywhere. And now that I've read his correspondence and his journals, he was the most polite person who ever lived. The thought of his saying something like that to someone who worked for him is completely unbelievable. Wow. So that's great. I'm glad we can clear that up because yeah. I'm not even sure that that was the only place. Right. Exactly. Because I... In many places. Yeah. I think I did. Everybody knows. Even in the Times Book Review, the, um, the reviewer, who herself is an astrophysicist, repeated that story just to say that that was what she knew of Pickering. In reading my book, she realized it wasn't true. Yeah, and, it, you know, I, I read your book, and then I went, what I did was, you know, after I read it, I went back and then did more research, like, on YouTube and in Wiki, you know, to come out. And I'm, and now that you say that, I'm like, I, you know what? I, I, Well, I absolutely know now that I didn't get that from your book, but I did think to myself, I didn't remember reading it. <laughs> so now I know why, right? Yeah. So that's interesting. Okay, so he when he hires her, he does hire her as mate. She does start as a mate, mate for him, Wilhelmina. Yes. Okay. And then, that. and then he realizes that she could do some of the work that yeah. he would. So is that okay? Over to the observatory. Right. Okay. Awesome. The so then, right next door. Right. They, they lived. The Pickerings lived practically in the observatory, so it was a, just a short hop to have her work in the observatory instead of the house. And I kind of went through this um, in chronological order just to get it right in my brain. And and then I thought I could just ask you to explain it a little bit more in detail for everybody. So um, what with each one of these women uh, did, Wilhelmina was known for her classifying, measuring, and computing the stellar magnitudes and she discovered a lot of variable stars. She made several important discoveries by looking at the photographs. Which I wish, you know, everybody needs to go. I mean, in your book, you have great pictures of them, and there are also really good pictures of them on um, YouTube from your some of your lectures. I do it's not... on the Harvard website. You can... Oh, on the Harvard website. Okay. Yeah. It's unbelievable that these that they can look at these glass pictures and distinguish these stars. It's crazy, I, I think, you know. And to be following pictures of an area over time and be able to identify how much the stars change over time. It's <laughs> not something anyone could do. It is It is mind-blowing. It really is, um, you know, that they... They could look at those little it look, what looked like smudges on a on a glass and say, "Oh, this changed in some way from the last time I saw it." You know, 
and know that that was the star. It was just I, everybody needs to look at those pictures. But anyway, we'll move on just because I'm, <laughs> there's a lot to get through. But um, in the beginning of your book, it starts off with Anna Palmer Draper and her husband, Henry Draper. And I remember their names because if you ever watched Mad Men, they, yeah. he uses yeah, yeah, Don you, Draper. You know? <laughs> Google Henry and Anna Draper, you, you, you come up with Don also. Yes. Yes. yes, which is pretty funny to me. But anyway, um, so, you know, just, okay, another thing is, is like the way this all just starts with, the, I'm always interested in how one event leads to another event, you know, in history. It's always like this puzzle, but it's perfect. And to me, that was the, the part of the puzzle that just became so perfect because she had money. You know, her husband dies, and then she decides, you know what, I'm just going to give money and all his stuff, and I'm going to give them to Harvard so that yep. people can move on, you know, with what he was doing and what they were doing together, right? And that is just, you know, that that's such a – isn't that like a huge lifesaver for the Harvard Observatory at that time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a love story. It's a love story. And do you know how much money she ended up giving them? I'm going to look it up because I have a bad memory for numbers. But she, it's it's more than a quarter of a million dollars. Which in this time, what I was thinking is like in that time compared to like this time, you know, I right. mean, it's a lot of money. Right. And she was giving it yearly. Was she not giving it yearly? Giving, oh, yeah, no, she was giving it yearly, approximately $10,000 a year. She started having financial difficulties and she cut it back out in half. But then she still provided for them in her will, and that's what I'm trying to remember. I think I think it was another hundred fifty thousand in her will. And and you know it's like it starts off with this very wealthy woman, well you know, and she's donating this money, and it's like I love how it's all you know the women that really save it, kind of. You know what I mean? I, I love how that women, part. The women did the work, and and. Much of the work was paid for, not just by Mrs. Draper, but you know. right. Like, and and for that time frame, like, isn't it crazy to think of these wealthy women, you know, back in the early 1900s? That you know, it, I, you know, I was when I when I was reading it, I was like, who knew? You know, who knew that these that there were just these women out there, and they had all this money, you know, that was theirs, you know, either through their father's estate or their husband's estate, and you know. Yeah, in her her will, she left them one hundred fifty thousand dollars, but she had already provided about two hundred fifty. She was she was supporting the work for about thirty years. Crazy, and then and then we move on to Antonia Mari, who was the niece of Henry Draper, because she then joins the staff. And um, but there's there's issues with what she does. Uh, she classifies some some of the, or she has a way of classifying some of the stars, and then I guess uh, Edward Pickering didn't agree with what she was doing, or he had some kind of criticism, and then she had left. So then she, but she did end up coming back, but she, yeah, she ended up leaving. But um, then on my timeline, I have like in 1895, Henrietta Swan Leavitt vo- starts volunteering at the observatory. She discovers the period luminosity relationship. And I am telling you, I've looked that up every which way I can, and I thought maybe you could explain it in easier terms for me. Sure. Okay. Okay. (laughs) She was looking at a particular type of variable star, and she was looking at them in a given region of space where she knew they were all roughly the same distance from Earth. And she noticed that the brightest ones took the longest time to cycle through their changes. And since all of them were roughly the same distance from Earth, she knew that the brightest ones, the ones that looked brightest really were brightest wasn't that they, they looked brighter because they were closer. They really mm. were bright. So, okay, the bright-
brightness of the star is correlated with the time it takes the star to go through its changes. That's what she noticed. And it was a pivotal discovery. Because now you could you calibrate that. So what does that mean? Let's say it's a, it's a 15 day star. That means a particular brightness. So if I'm looking at another region of space and I see one of these stars and it's taking 15 days to go through its cycle, I know that its intrinsic value, its intrinsic brightness is X from my calibration. And because it looks a lot dimmer than that, that means it's much farther away. You can actually calculate the distances of those stars by the time they take go through the wow. cycle of changes. And that discovery changed everything. It's what enabled Hubble to prove that there were galaxies outside the Milky Way. It was what enabled him to show that the universe was expanding. And it is still used now in, in current studies of the extent of of the universe and the the rate at which the universe expands. Yeah, and and to me it's like in the fact that to use those slides, you know, those plates, and and could figure that out, you know, like how yeah. no. much you have to study those, you know, to you re to, to pay attention. Yeah. And 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 notice things. I mean, that's that's what scientists. That's how they. Yeah, that's what keep them keeps them, you know, going hours and hours, and you know, is to to figure that out. And and she also would have won a Nobel Prize had she lived well, two years longer for that, right? But he was considering nominating her. It was such a fundamental discovery. It it enabled so many other things, beginning with uh, estimating the size of the Milky Way. Right. So, uh, so it was. It made sense to look back and say, "Hmm, this this has turned out to be even more important than people thought. Maybe we should give her a big prize." But she had already died. Yeah, that it's you know, because when I was reading it and and trying to understand it, and um, and I was like, how they figured out how far away they were. You know, we're not talking miles. We're talking, you know, how they figured out the distance of these stars, and you know, I'm, and I'm sure the math they had to use and and everything. It's just that's what I I think is the most mind blowing part about it, um, especially for that time too, because I I wasn't even realizing that this stuff was being done at this time. We've learned so much more, but but without them doing it at that time, we couldn't have learned as much as we do. You know. So it's, you know, so so then we go on to Annie Jump Cannon and her system for classifying stars. And the year was around, I, I got an estimate of, I think it was 1901 was the estimate on when she started classifying her stars and using the O-B-A-F-G-K-M. Well, class the, letters, the letters came from Mrs. Fleming. The Mrs. Fleming system was alphabetical, and it started with A. Uh-huh. And then Miss Morey made up her own system, which used Roman numerals. And so Miss Cannon was trying to make peace between the two systems. And uh, she, she stuck mostly with Mrs. Fleming, but she rearranged it. And that's how the alphabet got out of order. Interesting. Her arrangement turns out to express the different temperatures of the stars. Yeah, which, you know, again, was huge discovery. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, it was just, it didn't you know. know. what it was at the beginning. It was really a question of pattern recognition and setting up an order that, that seemed arbitrary. Right. It eventually... Eventually, it would make sense, or eventually, they would know why there were different types, and they did. 
And, and I found it interesting, too, that two out of these women had hearing difficulty um, to some extent. And I was thinking that that my, my I have a brother who is deaf in one ear and he it's very it's a very strange. I mean, he's 75 percent deaf in his other ear. So he's pretty deaf. Right. And and he has in a different way. He's not a scientist, but what he does, he does. They do seem to go into another world because they can't hear the chatter that other, you know, I find with him, you know, and when I was reading that, you know, how you put it, I was like, exactly, that's exactly what he does. And he never, he said in his life, and he's 50, and he said he's never asked to have hearing. He's never missed it. And he didn't live very long with hearing either, but he said he just never, because he likes it like that. And so, you know, when we go, when you went into how these women, you know, they didn't get married, some of them, you know, she didn't, and um, they just kind of lived, and I think that the concentration level, like they can, there, there's just something about that. There's something about the other senses that pick up, I think, mm-hmm. you know, so I found that very interesting, too. And the place where that handicap really didn't manifest as a handicap. They didn't Great. Did. Although, you know, Miss Cannon wasn't completely deaf. She was able to go to the opera, which she loved. So she had a hearing aid. Mm-hmm. She, um, without it, she didn't hear me. Yeah, my brother never even, he does not have a hearing aid. He doesn't, you know, for what he does. But who is the other one that was, I'm trying to look here, Mike. There's another one that was hard of hearing. Miss Levitt. Henrietta. Miss Levitt. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. I didn't write it on this. I have it on the other period. Okay. So <laughs> back to my notes here. Okay. So then the last one that I wrote down um, is Cecilia Payne. And I don't even, you say her name so beautifully. So I'll let you say her last name. Kapushkin. Kapushkin. There you go. Yeah. Right. And, um, and she comes along a little bit later. She was born in 1900, so she comes along a little bit later. They're already into their thing, in, you know, already doing she things. came as a graduate student, so she was in a completely different category. Correct. And and her work was they, her thesis. For, she was the first woman to receive a Ph.D. in astronomy from Harvard, which I love that first fact. Person, not oh, the first person. person. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And... Her thesis, so I'll let you explain because here's another thing that I'm, you know, I, that is beyond my, my pay grade, what her thesis was about. She came to this country from England because there didn't seem to be any future for her in astronomy in England. And she, she knew about Harvard. She knew there were a lot of women working there. And she also knew about the plate collection. And... She was at Cambridge University at a very interesting time because she was in early on atomic theory. And so for her, the the spectra that, that Miss Cannon and Mr. Fleming used to classify the stars, she could read other things into those patterns. And for her dissertation, she tried to determine the relative abundance of different chemicals in the stars. And she came to the conclusion that it was overwhelmingly hydrogen and helium. And this was not at all what people expected. People thought that the chemistry of the sun would be very much like the chemistry of the Earth. You could see that they were the same elements, so the assumption was that they would be in the same proportion. So the idea that hydrogen was about a million times more prevalent than anything else just seemed wrong. Hmm. And her, her advisor at Harvard and the authorities at the time, they admired her work and they, they knew she was on to something, but they just... They, they couldn't accept that point. And, but she, having brought it up and having called people's attention to it, 
other people started to look at the relative abundances, and it didn't take long for uh, new new ideas to come into play and for a, a full explanation of how it could be possible that hydrogen really was the major constituent of stars. So it was only about four years from people telling her that can't be right to astronomers saying, yeah, that's, that's what it is. They're mostly hydrogen. Wow. So that was exciting. Very exciting. And she also became the first woman to be a professor at Harvard. The first astronomy professor. Oh, the first astronomy professor. Yeah. Okay. And the first person to be, um, how did they phrase it? There, there was a woman teaching anthropology, and there was someone else in the medical school. But there was something about the way she, uh, she got her promotion. Promoted to tenure, I think, was the... Um, the term they use. Uh, hmm. So it, she kind of worked her way up? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, this, I mean, you know, I can't say enough about this book. I really can. I, I loved every page of it, and, you know, it's it's one of my favorites. <laughs> it's, it's definitely one of my favorites. And I thought that maybe we, you could um, talk a little bit about, you know, say there's this, uh, college student or a young adult and they're out there and they're like, I want to write books, you know, I want to find that that book that nobody's written about, you know, that, that period in history that nobody knows anything about and, you know, what what do you suggest like uh, that they, how they go about doing that? I mean, these, did these stories kind of, did they kind of fall in your lap or did they take a lot of research to find them? Mostly they fell in my lap. Um, Longitude was, uh, I got that idea by being invited to that symposium. It was not a topic I was interested in before. I'd been interested in astronomy, but in Longitude, the astronomers are the bad guys. So that was a different kind of story. And then it was while working on Longitude that I discovered that Galileo had daughters who were nuns, which was a huge surprise because when I was in school, I was taught that he was the enemy of the Catholic Church. So I discovered that he had daughters who were nuns. Uh, This made me think that probably everything I'd been taught about Galileo was wrong and that it was really maybe a much more interesting story if he did all the things he did as a believing Catholic. I'm not Catholic, but that idea seemed really interesting to me. And she seemed, his daughter, the nun, uh, just seemed like a fascinating person. So then I was off on Galileo's daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, the planet idea, I I had been interested in planets since childhood. And uh, my... My agent had asked me a funny question, like, what is the difference between the solar system and the galaxy and between the galaxy and the universe? So, hmm. you know, that, that was his way of saying, I'm a well-educated person, but I don't know anything about astronomy, and I would like to know something. Um But he said when he tried to read about it, books either talked down to him or assumed too much prior knowledge. And he wanted to read something that would engage him at at his level of intelligence, but also his complete ignorance of the subject matter. So that was a really interesting challenge. Uh... So that's what the planets was about, um, uh, and that's why it it takes the shape it takes. Um, and then the Copernicus story that was something I had read about in 1973 when 
1973 was the 500th anniversary of Copernicus's birth. And so uh, a historian wrote, wrote up a short version of his life story for one of the astronomy magazines. And I didn't realize that he had come up with this idea about putting the sun at the center, but then mm. not tried to publicize it. Not it took him about 30 years, and it was only when a young student really came to find him and urge him to publish and stayed with him and got his manuscript into shape and actually took it to a publisher. And the whole thing just seemed incredible to me. It seemed, it seemed like a historical drama. And that's why right. I do it as a play. Uh, so that was, that was that book, which started as a play, then became a play within a book, and then, then I got to revise the play so that it could really be a play on its own. Hmm. The, the story of the Harvard women I first heard about uh, interviewing Wendy Friedman, who's an astronomer now at University of Chicago, but at that time she was with the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, and she was working on a Hubble telescope project about the expansion rate of the universe, and she mentioned the importance of Henrietta Leavitt's work, and I'd never heard of her. So... Hmm. Then I went to look for Miss Levitt, and and there were all these other women too, and I was astounded. Uh, so I've had that idea for a long time, and uh, always worried about how to do it because there were so many people, and it's a story that takes place over a long period of time. So. Um, it came with a lot of problems about how to focus the story, how to, could I really make all the characters individuals? Um, would there be too much science? Uh, but I was so, so taken with the story uh, that I, I was just determined to do it. Well, and how long did it take you to write it? Uh, I had a, a harsh, difficult deadline on this book, which I had never had. I've had deadlines on newspaper articles and magazine stories, but nobody had ever given me a serious deadline on a book before. In retrospect, I'm glad of it because um, the time was right for this story to come out. And um, even while I was working on it, I found somebody else who was trying to do the same thing, who wound up not doing it. Kind of felt, oh, I'm glad you're doing it now. I don't have to. <laughs> so Aww. That, that worked out well. Um, uh, so I think the writing took me maybe three years. And I, I would rather it had longer, but I'm, again, I'm glad I didn't drag it out. And I'm happy with the way it turned out. Oh. I, I, and I think to myself, three years, like, now, novelists can write, you know, a book, they can write a book every six months, every year, you know, and, but when you're, when you're dealing with something with this much information, you know, and that three years seemed like a short period is because you have to, you know, you have to, you have to make it a story, you know? If you count the, the background, too, it's more like five years. Wow. Because even to write a proposal, you have to you have to know quite a bit about the story. Right. And did you come up with the title, The Glass Universe? Yes. And I'm really I love that. I, I love it. I, I, I don't, yeah. I love the title. I love um, for one thing, it really is a glass universe, that plate collection. It's right. It's so extraordinary. The, uh, just the collection itself, the fact that there 
a hundred years of images of the sky in that place. Um, but then just the play on the glass ceiling, it's, uh, it's, it's really perfect. I, I, it's really perfect, and I, I love titles, you know, because I'm such a reader, and I love when I see a title that just, you know, grabs you right away, like, you you know, and, and the cover, I mean, the cover is beautiful. Uh, and I'm really happy with it. Mm-hmm. The jacket designer did a gorgeous job. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. 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 So, okay, so you said, I don't want to end this conversation without asking you this, that you wrote a book about or you helped somebody write a book about um, what is out there, you know, and yeah. so what do you, uh, you know, all this research you've done, what is your opinion of what is out there? Of whether there's life elsewhere? Yes. In the yes. It's, all I can say is it's statistically likely because the universe is vast and the chemicals for life are are made in stars as a natural outcome of the way stars burn. So the materials are there. Uh, did it happen on another planet? Nobody knows. And it, and it's me, I, I talk about this a lot with my children, you know, uh, they always want to know. And because I, I actually studied um, some astronomy with my one son who's in middle school this year. And, you know, that's always their first question. What, what do you think, Mom? Is there something? And I'm like, it's hard to imagine not. Right. It's hard. That question is harder to imagine than there is because both they might, but it might, it doesn't, may not look like us. It may not look like oh, what no. we think is, yeah, you know, it, we're out there looking. Go ahead. Just to think there was a time on Earth when when a large portion of living things were dinosaurs, anything like us. So right. it can go all sorts of ways, even right here. So who knows what what it would be like if it happened somewhere else. And 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 even the time frame, you know, um, because. They, you know, people like to argue, well, if there was intelligent life somewhere, why wouldn't they, you know, why wouldn't we know? Why wouldn't they try to get in touch with us? Or, But when you think about the time frame that, that we're looking at the past, you know, that it's, it, the timing has to be perfect also, right? Right, right. I mean, they, they could have created a civilization and killed themselves off in a war or a uh by squandering all the resources of their planet, as we might yet do, this planet. Uh, or maybe they don't want to be in touch with us. We don't want to <laughs> be interesting. Um, who knows? There's so many possibilities. I mean, a lot There's of so many. That since, since we haven't been visited, that's proof that there's nothing else, but I don't find that. Well, when you look at those glass, even if you look at those glass images, okay, of how many different things are out there, it's, you know, to say, well, they didn't find us. It's a pretty big place, you know. <laughs> you know, what What do you see, you know, you you just brought up like, you know, how we could also go through our resources. I mean, what do you see as a potential? I always think, you know, that there'll continue to be discoveries and, and you know, scientists will always figure out how to keep civilization here going. Even, you know, you, I am, I am more hopeful. <laughs> I I try to be optimistic, but the way things are going now, I'm really nervous. Hmm. It does seem to have picked have up speed. Too. I don't I don't like the the disregard for the limitations of the planet. Uh, the disregard for evidence that we're making it warmer. We really are. Yeah, and the and it does seem to have picked up speed, don't you think, too? Even in our limited time here. Definitely, every year is right. markedly hotter than the year before, year after year. That there is not a pattern for that, as long as people have been keeping records of 
temperature. Well, one other um, interesting thing for me was that um, you were born the same year as my mom. My mom had me very young because <laughs> I'm not that young, but uh, she was only 16. But my mom never lived without a telescope in her backyard. How oh, great. And, you know, it was, which is kind of funny, my mom was not an educated person. She had me, you know, she had to quit high school. She had me at a, in the 60s during a time when, you know, that's what you did yeah. when you got pregnant. And she got, you know, that she got married and she did the, the mom, the stay-at-home mom thing. And But she always had a telescope. And she was always telling us, you know, like, well, this is happening. You know, this is happening tonight, everybody. You know, and she was always – and then in her later years, she passed away a couple of years ago. And my children always say how much they miss her text saying, don't forget to look up in the sky tonight because this is happening tonight. And, you know, she was always on top of it. And I wondered – after I, you know, read the book and then I, I looked up to, see, you know, I looked you up on Wikipedia and saw that you were born in 1947, and I thought, was there something about that time? Did were, were people interested? Did, did did it become a time that everybody was, you know, did she grow up in a time? Because I can't ask her this question, but you know, now that I see that, I'm like, what made her so interested? She didn't have a background in that. She didn't have. You know, was there something going on in the 50s and 60s that made people start to pay attention to the skies? Yes. Well, first of all, I think people have always paid attention. But it's 1957, Sputnik, and then mm-hmm. Kennedy's promise that we would go to the moon within the decade of the 60s, and that happened. It was on everybody's mind. It was Interesting. Very part of everyday conversation. People knew the names of the astronauts. It was um, it was thrilling stuff. Well, I and now you know I think about it. It used to be we would always call it like her quirky thing, you know, like oh there she is out there looking at. The <laughs> she was probably doing. She was looking at the planets or. Um, yeah, oh yeah. Probably that, and knowing which planets were visible when and what would be a beautiful alignment to look at. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I would have gotten along great. <laughs> well, I, I thank you for that because now it doesn't make me think, you know, it kind of puts a puzzle piece together for me about her, you know, because I was like, oh, she really was. Like, she, you know, she loved it. She had an interest in it. She was always looking up there for some, you know, that was her thing. And and now I know why, you know. Now I can put together that piece of, you know, exactly what made her do that, you know. So, I thank you for that. But anyway, well, this has been so awesome. I, I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me about this. And I, I hope I can spread the word, you know, everywhere for people to read this book and, you know, to really it, – it's a fascinating time. Like I said, the, the timing of Hidden Figures and then your book, is, it's an awesome time for women to be proud of the women that came before us and what they accomplished. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Long may they wave. <laughs> That's exactly right, and I, I'm so happy that you got to do this book and, and got to do all the research for it. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you, Michelle. Yeah, th- <laughs> you too. Have a great day. Thank you.